So thanks for being here tonight. Um, I want to welcome David Goodwillie. He is the author of the novel uh, American Subversive, which was a New York Times notable book of the year, and the memoir seemed like a good idea at the time. Goodwillie has written about books for the New York Times and the Daily Beast, and his nonfiction has appeared in New York Magazine, Newsweek, Popular Science, and Men's Health. He's also been drafted to play professional baseball, worked as a private investigator, and was an expert at Sotheby's Auction House. A graduate of Kenyon College, he lives in Brooklyn. And Molly Jong Fast is the author of Normal Girl, Girl Maladjusted, and The Social Climbers Handbook. She's written for many newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, W Magazine, Cosmo, The Times UK, and Marie Claire. She lives in Manhattan. She's married to a recovering academic, and they have three very small children, all of whom like to talk to her when she's on the phone. Again, thanks everybody for being here. Welcome David and Molly, and let's talk about Kings County. Great. Rachel, thank you so much. David's going to start and read a little bit of the book. He's going to read us like just a tiny bit, and then we're gonna, I'm going to ask him lots of questions. Um, that sounds great. I just want to thank Molly, too, for being here. If you know anything about Molly, she is basically uh, one of the great stars of political Twitter at the moment, and we're having a big politics night outside of literature, so I'm very glad she could join us for a while. Um, I'm going to read uh, uh, the book, uh, Kings County. Here it is, uh, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it is a novel about two uh, people from kind of middle of nowhere in America who moved to New York uh, in the early and mid 2000s and uh, fall deeply in love with each other. They are living in um, Brooklyn at a time when the music scene in Brooklyn is booming and um, they... Uh, fall deeply in love and then uh, one of their pasts comes to light and they uh, have serious trouble in their relationship. The woman is named Audrey Benton. She works as uh, a manager for indie bands and I'm going to read a part where one of her favorite bands uh, is described. It's right in the first chapter and it hopefully will give you a bit of insight into the music scene in New York but also uh, into what it's like to move to New York from somewhere else uh, to follow your kind of uh, dreams, I guess, to simplify it. And I have to take my glasses off because I'm getting old and I can't see anything. Um, and this is Audrey kind of narrating uh, about, about her band. Uh, and they're called the Westfield Brothers. How had they done it? Talent and ambition, sure, but these were New York words. And while they certainly applied to the Westfield Brothers, Audrey attributed their success to something less definable, a kind of urgency born of circumstance. Ben and Arthur Westfield were from Cripplebush, a Hudson Valley hamlet old enough to have traditions and secluded enough to keep them. Their parents were self-taught musicians who for years hosted ramshackle Sunday jamborees on their front porch, bringing old timers down from the hills, toting instruments from other epics, dulcimers, lumber horns, clackamores. They looked homemade but sounded otherworldly, and so did their accompanying voices, their mothers among them, above them, enveloping each song with careworn tenderness the way a clean sheet fell on a bed. That's how, that's how Ben had once described it to Audrey. The parties, they called them knockabouts, would last all day. Hymns, folk songs, mountain blues, half the town showing up most weeks, grilling food, drinking from unlabeled bottles, the aged and infirm propped up in lawn chairs, just watching and listening, the way you did in these rural outposts for hours, for years. And how could the two young brothers not become a part of it? not start fiddling and strumming and banging on things, not learn to play the songs that they heard, and then start writing them some themselves, tough luck, tough luck stories and outlaw ballads, simple and derivative at first, but less so as time passed. Teenage summers, the two becoming three when they added Easter Woods, their grade school friend, a socially awkward music prodigy from a meth wrecked home who slept over half the time and then all the time taking up residence among the instruments in the basement, their self-appointed curator and guardian. They started small, house parties and local festivals. High school became an annoyance and then an afterthought, replaced by the kind of changeless small town jobs that crushed a person without a sideline, an outlet, a mission. Ben became a bouncer. Arthur worked stints at the municipal dump, 
and in the warmer months reshingled roofs with Easter until the latter, stoned, fell off an A-frame and fractured his skull. But he could still fiddle with a cracked head, and though the roofing concern went bust, the band gigs kept coming. They accepted every invitation, learning through trial and error the tricks of performing live, pedal loops and distortion, movement and stage presence, venturing forth to nearby towns, to neighboring counties, to the forlorn cities of industry still dotting the North Country landscape. Finally, they headed south to New York, once and then again and again, metal to the magnet, until like Easter in the basement, the temporary became permanent, and they found themselves subletting a bed-bug-ridden, bed exposed wire work-live space in the barren and not yet fashionable reaches of South Williamsburg, Brooklyn. They arrived, as Audrey had not long before them, at the height of a specific cultural moment, born of the jangly rhythms, retro stylings, and put upon attitudes of a loose cluster of artistic-minded contrarians. These were the muscular years following 9-11, but the young denizens of their particular Brooklyn weren't political activists or aspiring intellectuals. They weren't unified in much at all behind, beyond a loose belief in creative self-expression. But how to channel it? The art world was too insidery, photography too accessible, writing too antisocial, and in the end, too hard. What remained was music and the sprawling canvas of indie rock part grunge, part Brit invasion, part disco and hip hop, folk and electronic, fashion and spectacle. It could be stripped down or layered up, and as such was so fragmentarily derivative as to be thoroughly original. The barriers to entry were low, the odds of success or at least stylish failure enticingly high, and that was enough. By the first years of the new century, the immigrant neighborhoods of North Brooklyn had cracked open and beautiful bedraggled 20-somethings were pouring in. They arrived from that vast American other, dreamy theater majors and art school grads, suburban iconoclasts and Rust Belt misfits, some fully formed, but most needing time among similar minds and sensibilities, other people doing weird shit, wearing weird shit, smoking weird shit, busloads of kids who understood firsthand the suffocating lassitude of cultural homogeneity, the illogical sameness of everywhere else. Of course, Williamsburg, the ground zero of this non-movement, had its own indigenous codes. And as it happened, just then, the, pre the prevalent look was exactly congruent to what Ben, Arthur, and Easter already wore. Carhartt jackets and denim cutoffs, work shirts and wife beaters. And while they understood that irony was involved, not everyone, in fact, almost no one hailed from their type of manure-scented nowhere, they never did comprehend or really care about the complex sociological factors that produced that irony. In a, layer, in a world of layered artifice, they were wholly authentic, not that they realized that either. How they changed from those early days, grown up physically, acquired the tempered weariness of prolonged creative struggle. Arthur was now a genuine front man, handsome and charismatic, bending his skinny frame into the songs as if willing them to life. Ben, twice his age, was large, sweat-drenched, the soul of the group, standing center stage, cradling his accordion like it was a baby in a sling tempos and moods, the entire spirit of the show emanated from him. And then Easter and Gatesy, the two always lumped together despite their evident dissimilarity. Easter Woods was shy and aging early, but confident on stage as he moved between instruments, while Gatesy, the drummer they'd found some months ago at a gig in New Paltz, was a frenetic body of energy perpetually surrounding himself with women he never brought home. His true interest, his real love, being the band itself, its members and music its currency. In this most anonymous of cities, a band provided identity, community, and cover. Notoriety, if it came, only heightened the experience. The group becoming a separate life force, its individual members were forever trying to comprehend and control. You made the band, and then the band made you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I, so, I'm I'm glad that you read that. That was really great. What what got what got you going on this? How did you come up with this idea? This is your third book. Can you talk about uh, that? That's gosh, that's a good question. Um, I tend to uh, I've always I came to writing late, and I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder in terms of like how you become a literary writer, like you know, with quotes around it. What makes somebody a literary writer? Um, for me, I think one of the definitions of it is that you try something different every time. 
uh, you don't get stuck in kind of a, a mold or you don't have a character that appears in five books in a row or something like that. You don't write the same type of book every time. Uh, obviously, my first book was a memoir, uh, which kind of is a own beast. Uh, then my second book was a very political book. Uh, I try, tend to write about things that bother me in the world. I started that book during the end of the Bush administration. Um, it's about political radicals, or pe normal people who become political radicals um, in the kind of uh, mold of the old weather underground. Um, and then I did that political book and I didn't want to write about politics anymore. And so I decided I wanted to write about um, music and art and love, I guess. And so I started with the idea of a love story. And how do you write a love story in this day and age? You, um, you know, you, it's all good and well to say a love story is great, but like you have to place it somewhere geographically. You have to have characters uh, that are in trouble, even if they're in love. You need like stakes in, in a novel. And um, I really just started with a character and I wasn't sure, characters and I wasn't sure what the story was going to be. And I wrote my way into the story, which um, not all authors do, but I tend to not know what the ending of the story is going to be when I start it. Um, and I'm always fine with that. I always don't, I don't mind kind of like um, moving through the fog a bit as I write. And that definitely was the case here. And the story found itself through the characters who I knew and could envision very, very clearly the whole time. And so that's kind of, and I also wanted to write about this age that I was describing in Williamsburg from 2000 to 2010, where I always lived in Manhattan during that age and I'm not a musician, but I always admired from afar the fact that there was this very specific scene going on there and that everyone who wanted to be a certain type of musician, it seemed from in the whole country was moving to like 10 square blocks of Greenpoint and Williamsburg. And um, something was definitely happening there. Uh, and I talked about this a bit in the last uh, Zoom thing I did where like, it was a definitive scene that I felt repeats itself in America every 10 years, uh, whether it was like Nashville in the 50s music wise, Haight-Ashbury in the 60s, Laurel Canyon in LA in the 70s, uh, kind of the, uh, the scene in Detroit in the 80s, Seattle in the 90s. And here it was happening right across the river from me. And I always wanted to experience it and be a part of it even if I wasn't a real part of it. And I always thought that I would write about it at some point because it is rare where you have a geographic art uh, uh, movement take off. And I also think it could be the last one because of uh, what's happened with the internet and digitally, uh, you don't need that geographic um, experience with other people, or maybe you do need it, but you're not gonna get it now because everybody's making music on their computers now. And it's a very different type of experience. And maybe you have your own community on, online, I don't know, but it's not geographic in the real world like it used to be. So. What happened in Brooklyn um, in the first 10 years of this century might be the last time we really experienced something like that. Hmm. Um, what do you think, what was the, was there, are these characters like, I, I've written novels where they've been based on real people. Are these characters based on real people? Uh, I put you on the spot, but what, who's the girl? Uh, they are not based on real people at all. Um, they are from places that I had never been in my life before I researched this book. The woman, Audrey Benton, is, she's in her 30s in the book, but the flashback, she's in her 20s. And uh, she's from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And she, and she grows up in a trailer park just outside in, on Merritt Island, just outside watching the rockets go up all the time and dreaming of something bigger. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's also true. I mean, I, I'm always fascinated, and I'd love to talk to you about this, because you grew up in New York versus someone like me who moved here. Um, to experience New York. Um, both of my characters moved here from somewhere else. Uh, and uh, she's from Cape Canaveral. He's from a mill town in Massachusetts, Lawrence, Massachusetts, that's fallen on hard times in the last 20, 30 years because all the mills have closed. Um, I, I like the challenge of writing characters that are not from my real life. And part of that is having written a memoir where everybody was very much real um, and feeling a bit like, uh, never super comfortable with answering like questions about family members or questions about good friends or uh, girlfriends or whatever it would be that I had written about. Um, I got that kind of out of my system and ever since then I very much created characters from scratch. Um, that said the places in the book, restaurants, bars, streets, parks, like are all very much real places in New York and that to me is part of the fun of writing about New York is you um, 
you know, if you're, if you're reading it and you're from New York, you recognize those places and you're like, oh my God, that's so, like, I ate a Balthazar last week or whatever it was. And you like enjoy recreating the scene through literature. If you've never been to New York, it's like this new kind of visceral experience to read about these places you might somewhat, sometime want to go to uh, and kind of experiencing and enjoying New York from afar. So I always include real stuff, but not real people in, in my fiction, I guess. That's interesting. Why did you, in your book, why did you make it fiction instead? Well, I, I haven't written a book in a long time, but the la the most, I mean, I always feel like it's based on people, even if it's not really people, you know, that there's a certain, that the people may not be exactly, there's a, that I always feel like you, you kind of, you latch onto certain characteristics or they yeah. may not be exactly the same, but there's been, you know, so I was curious about like, just sometimes, I, I mean, I think it depends, but mm. I was curious about that. So everything comes from somewhere. Like it's, you know, like right. it might not be a person, but like a characteristic is of a person, you know, the specific characteristics are like, uh, there's a cat in the book that's a pain in the ass. And that cat is definitely from real life and experience, but like, um, part of the joy of fiction for me is very much like making up those characters and making them believable. Um, and in some ways it can be difficult to, I remember writing my memoir, it was very difficult to write about real people because you're trying to get them exactly right on the page. And it sometimes didn't feel quite real. Like that I wasn't doing my job well enough because that person was more nuanced than I was making them or whatever it was, you know, that, that didn't quite, like I wasn't quite capturing the real person. And in that way, writing fictional people is much easier, I guess. Um, what are you going to do next? Uh, uh, well, this is something you could talk to as well. I find it very difficult to write about the present moment in fiction. Right. Uh, the world is moving so quickly. Uh, so much of it is unbelievable and so unbelievable to the point where like you couldn't it, like politics is just it just kind of oozes into everything even if you don't want to write about politics um, I feel like I've written three books in a row three books in a row that are basically very New York-y and very contemporary um, even though this takes place almost 10 years ago it's a very like uh, vivid now kind of book it seems like um, I wouldn't mind trying my, well, I know what I'm going to do. I am going to write some historical fiction. Right. Um, I do start with these grand themes. Like you could say my last American subversive was politics. This one was love. I'd like to write the next one about money and how money corrupts and what money does to people or, or doesn't do to people. But like, I'd like to follow, um, follow money around a bit as it falls through generations and as it falls through hand, different hands. And I think that would be a very fascinating way to explore themes that I want to explore. And I always do want to explore themes in fiction. I want to write about stuff that's bothering me in the real world because that keeps me interested in the books. It keeps me interested in writing. Like I'm trying to, writers are very good at asking questions and very bad at providing answers, fiction writers, I think. Uh, but I really like asking the questions and exploring the questions. And the readers are, you know, can answer however, however they want. But like, um, I think that that's kind of a, a novelist's job is to ask those questions. Um, this book was on the cover of the New York Times book review. What, when you saw it, did you just have a heart attack? I mean, that is like the best it's gonna get. Um, well, it wasn't on the cover. It did have a full page. It was the first review in the, in the uh, okay. review last Sunday. That's very nice of you to say. Um, yeah, like the Times is still the last, it's the last standalone book review in the country okay. of all the newspapers. Uh, the LA Times lost their couple years ago. Uh, that review means a ton. Um, as a writer, you know you're going to get a review. They, they tell you a month or two in advance, or they tell your publisher. Um, they don't tell you who's reviewing it and they don't tell you what the review is going to be, whether somebody's enjoying the book. They don't tell you any of that stuff. Um, it's massively nerve, nerve wracking for that month or two. You try not to talk about it. You try not to think about it. You try not to ask your publicist 10 times if they've heard anything about it, mm -hmm. uh, all of which is impossible because you know, it's going to, it can make or break a book that review. Um, 
And then once it comes out, you get hopefully other press from that if it, if it does well. Um, I happen to have read the uh, Adele Waldman reviewed my book, who was a novelist uh, who wrote one of my favorite novels of the last 10 years. Uh, it might be about 10 years old, eight or 10 years old. Um, and she's she married really to Michael Chabon, right? She is not married to Michael Chabon. Oh, that's a different. That's a different, yes. Yeah, all right. Different, yes, uh, this is Adele. Not um, she can be really tough on stuff she doesn't like, and she was very nice to this book, which, um, you know, you write a book for, you get too close to books. You write books for so long. This took me seven years, um, and you just cross your fingers. It's such a subjective art, um, and people either love it or they don't, and you put it out in the world, and you just hope for the best. Yeah. But that's very nice of you to say. Yeah, just a nice, a lovely review. <laughs> um, it's exciting, I think. Yeah. So I, my, you know, it's interesting to me because the world of novels, like the world, like it's just changed so much. Like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there were all these places that reviewed book, that reviewed novels yeah. and that covered novels. And there's so much less of that now. Have you been struck by that over the years? It's, it's so, my last book before this came out, almost 10 years ago and um it's a totally different world there's a whole marketing team to your publishing house now that wasn't there or at least that didn't deal with the author last time and now social media is such a big part of um the kind of birth of the novel and and publicizing the novel uh that it's almost as important to get reese witherspoon to hold it up on instagram as it is to get a big review in a newspaper um yeah. And that's a very weird thing to come to terms with because you want publishing, especially literature, to be a pure kind of thing. And that doesn't mean it's not pure. It's just, it's a very strange kind of way to think about publicizing something. And it feels like the book world is the last world to kind of fall into that um, situation uh, with yeah. social media, but it's, um, it is what it is. And that's a huge part of it. So you have a social media campaign that goes hand in hand with the actual like sending galleys of books out to major newspapers and magazines and is, uh you is know. the new york times review this is like a larger question but is a book review more pure than a celebrity endorsement wow well that's like <laughs> right i mean not to be like too cynical here but there definitely is like i mean yes celebrities you know do with that what you will but uh, but right. someone you know, like Reese Witherspoon, you feel like is, is going to read the book, right? right. Like all the other celebrities that would just, you know, hold the book up because it makes them, you know, it ticks off the, the book box for them and the literary box, you know, like it depends on what, where somebody's coming from, uh, you know, and I don't want to get too cynical about it because at this point, like, you know, a writer will take anything he or she can get, uh, right. wise in the book, there's this, uh, Theo, the main uh, guy character, um, Audrey's boyfriend in the book, is having this crisis of conscience. And he is a, um, as I said, he's moved down from this mill town in Massachusetts to break into the publishing world. But the publishing world is extremely uh, patrician and old world still right. back then, especially. It's changing very quickly. Um, and he doesn't have the credentials. He doesn't have the boarding school. He doesn't have the, the MFA. He doesn't have that stuff. And he can't break in for a long time. And he works his way up basically from the mail room. Um, and he gets to the, you know, he starts, he becomes an editor eventually. But he's so, such a purist that he keeps buying these books that are too literary and too flowery and nobody's going to read them. And so he finally gets fired. Um, and he has this kind of, crisis of conscience moment where he's like, I don't understand the world. Like I've been struggling to reach all these years, you know, the pinnacle of publishing in New York city, like it barely exists anymore. And like, what am I supposed to do with that? And like, he goes through the whole notion of selling out. And um, uh, there's this line he has about um, Moby in 2003. Uh, you probably remember this. Like he sells his song to a like Volkswagen. And everybody in the world was like, what a sellout, like selling a song to a commercial. It's like, or it's like George Clooney doing those coffee commercials. Like he's one of the first big celebrities to do it in the U.S. They, they always used to do it in, J in Japan where the U.S. market couldn't see. 
and everybody would be like, what a sellout doing that. And now that whole idea of a celebrity being a sellout at all is an absurd idea. Like right. it just is not, nobody cares. Like it just doesn't matter. But Theo, even though it's 10 years ago, is like working through these things because I think it's important as a writer to like, to still work through those things and to not accept necessarily the world as it is totally now and to wonder how we got from A to B and like, is that right? And like, uh, you know, I don't know. These are questions that I always have that bother me a lot that I love exploring through literature. I think it's, I mean, I think it's interesting. I just wonder, like, like I've seen the evolution of publishing from like 1995 world where there was a, there was a Boston Globe book supplement and a Miami Herald supplement and right. an LA Times and the New York Times. And there was a lot of book, publish, book sections in every magazine to a world now where there's just not a lot of book publicity, but that it has, it's a little bit different the way that that universe works. And I just am curious about if it's more democratized now. I mean, the problem of people not reading, and that is a, pro is a real problem. And then there's also the problem of people, you know, not reading local newspapers. I mean, that's something we talk a lot about yeah. in more political landscape is this idea of of um not you know that facebook has really sort of sucked up all that ad revenue yeah and um but i am i wonder i always am like a little bit hesitant to uh embrace the idea that things have gotten less good even I'm sure things have gotten less good and a great example is what you're spending a lot of time doing is podcasts right, right. where uh, if our listeners don't know, uh, Molly has one of the great podcasts in the country right now uh, that you do with Rick Wilson. It's a very political podcast. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah. And I now spend time that I, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, would have spent listening to music in a car, right. listening to stories and listening to uh, political stuff, and, you know, with podcasts and getting deep into stuff. You know, that I would otherwise not get deep into. I read more time stories because, or Wall Street Journal stories, whatever, because I'm scrolling down and down and down instead of flipping through pages of a paper. So I'm actually getting more news. Um, I don't think the landscape is, def is necessarily bad in some ways. I do agree that the local paper situation is awful. Yeah. Um, the old alt weeklies, which basically were the beating heart of every arts, art, art scene in cities is gone. Uh, and not necessarily been replaced online very well. No. Um, stuff like books. Books are interesting because I feel like they've always been a bit word of mouth and that the great like successes in, in the book world are still like word of mouth. It's still people telling their best friends and their neighbors and their book clubs, oh my God, we got to read this and yeah. uh, word spreading that way. And to this day, like Publishers spend tons of money on books that go nowhere and totally vice versa. Yeah. And nobody really knows what that solution is or what that equation is um, to make a successful book. But yeah, certainly it helps to have like a bunch of top reviewers all review something incredibly well. And that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, if it does, it happens rarely but yeah. because there aren't that many top reviewers. Right. Um, well, that is a strange phenomenon too to not have. I mean, it used to always be you would have these top reviewers and it just... It, the yeah. world really changed in that way. And, and that said, there are so many books still being published and so much literature still being right. published that every Tuesday you have uh, 10 or 20 really good literary novels coming out and you don't have all that space in the Washington Post and in the New York Times and then the LA Times for it, you know? Well, I feel like this has always been an issue that more people want to write than read. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, if you're a writer at all and you go, I mean, I'm not doing a book tour right now, obviously, but you go around a book tour, you spend, or I spend half my Q&A time have, listening to someone tell me what they're going to write and they're just sitting down yeah. ready to write a book. Yeah, it feels like half of America is either writing a book or is about to. Yeah. Um, I'm, but, yeah. I, um, I was hoping people were going to ask us questions, but I guess they can't ask us questions, right? I think they can. They have to like email in i don't know i don't know the story with that yes but... i sent you guys a couple um oh are they in my email yep i which okay, i great. All right, couldn't, I'm couldn't gonna, communicate i'm <laughs> going to read some of these 
uh, emails. Okay. Um, how has your product, okay, this is a good one. David, you answer this. Uh, how has your productivity been affected by the pandemic? Oh, man. Um, a lot. I mean, I got COVID in March, so I was down oh. in for like a month uh, until mid-April. I got it early on, and um, I got lots of antibodies for whatever that's worth. But it Was, was it really hospital. scary? Yeah, I was pretty sick. I didn't go to the hospital, but like I was pretty sick. I was kind of upstate, and it wasn't fun at all. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I got better. I, I always find it very difficult to write, uh, seriously in the time between when your galley comes out six months before your book does and the actual book comes out because it's a ton of press you're trying to do. It's a ton of like sending a book out to a million people. You're very like anxiety riddling time. It's just yeah. a difficult time to focus on another book, but I do do a ton of research and a ton of reading during that time. Uh, and I read more this spring than I think I've ever read, like wondrously so. It was like a lifesaver talking about reading. Like um, I became a writer whom I love of reading. That's all, that's the way I knew. Um, oh, if you want to email questions, you can, sorry to interrupt you. What? You can email questions to, I can't read this because it's Rachel, and I can read it. Rachel, you read it, put it up again because David has better eyes than I do. I can read it. Uh, Rachel at Rachel K Barry B A R R Y dot com. Okay, if you have questions for us. Um, yeah, so I uh, was not super productive writing a new book this spring, but I was like writing articles and interviews around this book, and you know, reading a ton of stuff about the next book. And I, I think the I don't know how you feel about this. You seem to be it's in a massively productive phase right now, but. Um, <laughs> you know, also it can be deceiving from the outside, but like, I, I think people have handled the pandemic artistic wise in very different fashion. Some people have gone down in the heap and not done anything for six months. And, you know, the, and that's totally understandable. And other people are in such a groove that, you know, um, it's incredible and everything in between. Um, I write my little pieces. You write a ton I, of- But I write, you know, if I, it, it, some days I don't write. Like today I waited around uh, to see if I was going to write about Camilla and decided not to write about Camilla. I'm going to write something about Camilla for later on, but not like a newsy hook. Yeah. Piece. Um, But, you know, if I don't write, I haven't written since Saturday and today is Tuesday and I did the podcast yesterday. So if I haven't written for like three days, yeah. I start to get a little like, what am I doing on this earth? Yeah. Molly yeah. also had, uh, cause I was just listening to it. She just had Mary Trump on her podcast. It's really podcast good. Podcast ago. Yeah. And it is one of the great, like, she's, just, minutes, so. she's just great. Like yeah, she's just smart and doesn't give a fuck and is like very cool. Yeah. That, I think it's worth listening to too. Um, yeah. But our best episodes have been Eddie Glade from Princeton. He, we've had him on twice, and he's right. the head of African American Studies at Princeton. And he just wrote a book about. Yeah, um, a last week. yeah, he's just so he's just he just ha is really smart and just yeah. knows a lot of stuff. And every time he talks, I'm like, oh, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um, uh, so but yes, that so the next question is. Um, what do I think about the Kamala Harris announcement? And I, I'll, I'll ask you first, David, because it's your event, and then I'll. Uh, I was, um, I was relieved. I, I thought it was a, his best choice. I thought it was a really good pick. I wanted them to choose a black woman. Um, I wanted someone with experience. Biden's no spring chicken. Uh, I, you know, no one in the Democratic field is like has a perfect background. I think. Uh, including the president or the including the uh, Biden um, I think it was the best pick he had and I, I'm really glad he did it uh, uh, I, it would have been my pick I was very psyched I couldn't believe how you know I got very like excited yeah. about her I had been excited about her but I had I had whatever during the primary process which was like 25 years ago and who can even I mean it feels like it was three centuries ago. I don't know. I When I heard it today, I was like, yes. And I got very excited that there was this, there's something about her. She feels, and it's funny because I really have, in, I've interviewed a bunch of these women and like, I love Tammy Duckworth, like you mm -hmm. can't believe. And I'm a big 
fan of Al Demings, but there was something about Kamala that just got me very excited. Like yeah. she reads very young and ex in a way that, that Obama did, like very exciting and young. And even though people are mad, people don't like that she was a prosecutor and people have this or whatever, yeah. she feels very young to me and uh, different and exciting. And when it happened, I was like, we all knew what was going to happen. We all thought that was going to be his pick, but for some reason that was even more exciting. And I've, yeah. inter and I've interviewed um, Gretchen Whitmer and I'm a big fan of hers because she's very tough and she had all these yeah. like really scary militia guys protesting mm -hmm. in her and she did not, you know, she just did not give a fuck and was very tough. But uh, I did think that this was a really, that she, I got very, emotional about it. I, I, I think that despite Trump somehow running to the right and winning in the last election, I do think the Democrats are going to have to run a very traditional election where they have to run to the middle. Because because they're running against Trump, they're going to have the left like wrapped up. Nobody on the left is not is going to sit out the vote, I don't think. So they have to pick off some of that middle. And I think Kamala will help them. I don't think that like him picking somebody farther left than Kamala was gonna, is necessarily going to help him. Um, so in that way, I think her being more moderate uh, is, I mean, is a wise choice. The, you know, it's always going to be about what you can get legislated. Yeah. So if he can't win the Senate, it's yeah. a different calculus than if he can win the Senate. Right. So if Democrats want, if people here want to get involved, the, the sen those Senate races, Jamie Harrison, uh, Sarah Gideon, you know, Cal Cunningham, those guys, those mm -hmm. are the, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, so tell me, I have a, another question for you, which is when you were, so you have these books that are so different, that are so diamond, you know, they're all novel or they're two of them are novels and one's a memoir, yeah. but they're all different. Do you, um, do you see like, is that, do you feel like that makes you a different kind of writer, being able to hop around different genres? I think it makes me a writer in that I don't think I would be able to write a book that's similar to another book. I would just get bored doing it. Um, but yeah, I think it makes, um, it's the kind of writer I always like to read. Um, like I just like Emily St. John Mandel, who uh, is a, a novelist who writes a very different book every time out or David Mitchell who writes a very, or Colson Whitehead or Zadie Smith. These writers who write, you don't know what the book is gonna be, but you know you're gonna like it. And, you're, and, and if they pull it off, you're like, wow, what a great ventriloquist, what a great a storyteller. How did they write this person, you know, this epistolary novel here and this first person novel over, you know, it's just as a, as a reader, um, thrilling when I can read a writer who goes out on a limb every book and tries something different. And it, no book is ever, you know, no writer's ever, you know, hits the gold mine every time. They're like mistakes all the time. But um, I, I, I like the try, I like the effort. Okay, I have another question. Could you explain some of the research you conducted for the Challenger space shuttle scene? It was fascinating. Oh uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so, as I said, Audrey grew up, grows up in Cape Canaveral and around astronauts and around people who work at NASA because they all live in a very close area right around, um, right on Merritt Island or right close to the, in Titusville because the rest of Florida, there is swamps. So there's very, they have to all live right on the coast. Um, and so she lives right next door to an astronaut and they have launch parties in their front, in the yard of the, uh, the communal yard of the trailer park and they all celebrate the rocket with the shuttles going up and the shuttle program when it was going there were several shuttle trips several several shuttle launches a year so it was happening quite a lot so it was a real community gathering that happened um there is a scene when she is younger and in grade school i think she's like in third or fourth grade and it's that classic scene that very much i went through where it was 1986, I think, that the Challenger blew up. And because there was a teacher on that flight, every, the first teacher going to space, every single school like, got their kids in an assembly and they sat on the floor and they had a little TV wheeled in up front and they watched the Challenger lift off and they watched it explode. And it is like a seminal moment of somebody who's my age in their 40s 
um, mm -hmm. childhood. And I remembered it very well. And weirdly, I haven't seen it recreated in fiction very much or even talked about that much. So I just thought it would be a really cool um, recreation uh, to have that through Audrey's childhood eyes. Um, and they don't even know what's going on at first. She's so far back. She's playing with a bunch of Cabbage Patch dolls. You know, it's a, the third or fourth grade, like you're just things are bouncing off the wall. Uh, but meanwhile, the shuttle's exploding on TV. And it was just this very poignant scene. Um, I did a ton of research. I went up to NASA. I got a uh, private tour of uh, the space, of uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Um, there was one of my favorite things about writing novels is doing the research. Uh, I drove around Merritt Island, uh, where Cape Canaveral is, to find a place that made sense for her to live in her fictional life. Uh, and things like that I love to do. And I would look and see, okay, is this, can you see the launch pads from here? Like, is this make sense that she could have lived here? And that's how, that's how fiction happens. That's how, like, I'd much rather, and I would go take pictures and I would take those pictures back to New York. And I had to have a real sense of her life and what it would have been like as some, growing up in this particular trailer park in this particular island, five miles from the launch pads, watching shuttles go up. And that to me was exactly what I wanted to write. And so I went and found that exact trailer. And uh, I love doing that stuff. Um, the other question is, you write very strong female characters. What inspired your Audrey character? Uh, not wanting to write male characters all the time. Um, I think one of the great challenges in literature is to write the other, write what you're not. Um, obviously, that is an extremely tricky uh, conversation these days because uh, you can get into lots of issues um, and writers do all the time. Uh, and it is a big kind of raging thing in all the arts, um, appropriation and where is like, where is the line there where you're not allowed to write about something? Obviously, I think it's absolutely fine to be a male and write a female character, vice versa, be straight and write a gay character. That's fine. This, this, I mean, you wouldn't have fiction, you wouldn't have stories about this. Uh, would I go and write uh, a Pakistani immigrant story about moving here from Lahore, Pakistan? No, of course not. Like, you just, a lot of it's common sense, like what you, sh stories you should and shouldn't be able to tell. Um, but to me, some of the great joy is writing um, characters that are not me and don't have my upbringing and don't have my sense of the world and uh, live in, grew up in other places or whatever it is. Um, and certainly Audrey Benton, who's my ma main female character, uh, was an, uh, my favorite character to write, is an absolute joy to write her. A lot of stuff happens to her that was very... Um, is very dramatic in the book. And I was very careful to actually have my female friends who are kind of early readers of mine read that because there are certain things that as a male, I don't think I'm gonna have the best grip on or necessarily understand totally that I would love a women's per woman's perspective on. And I was right, I'd like blown, I'd like missed stuff and like not gotten reactions to stuff uh, correct and um, not gotten the emotional impact that a woman would have writing a female character. And I'm very glad that I went and talked to my female friends about it uh, because it helped the book immensely. That's fascinating. Do you guys have any more questions? We haven't had any come through, but thanks for those who sent them through. Um, and thank you guys both. We are so appreciative of your time um, for all the, the readers listening in tonight and, and from Word, David and Molly, we, we so appreciate it. Uh, we know everybody gets a little zoomed out. So we- oh, that's, um, Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I would just say that uh, Word is my neighborhood bookstore here in Greenpoint and I absolutely love it. Uh, they got another location in Jersey City. If you're gonna buy the book, please buy it from them. Uh, you can call them, you can get it on the website. Also, I will, um, I, uh, well, they have signed books, but I'll also dedicate any books to um, you. Just call the store and tell them what your name is and I'll be happy to dedicate it to you. Yeah, I uh, think, yes, definitely. Everybody, you could call on um, the Brooklyn store. The number is, I'll email this as well through Eventbrite, but the number is 718-383-0096. And of course, through the website. Um, and we so appreciate that you're also a customer. Yeah, <laughs> oh, pleasure. And here's the book again. Yeah, there it is. County, 
And Molly, thank you so much. When uh, your publisher asked you to do events, and I knew they were going to be, we we're going to have a Zoom summer. Uh, you were one of the first people that came to mind. We did an event like 10 years ago, probably 11 years ago at uh, McNally Jackson in the basement there. And uh, I just remember you being like so wonderful and engaging. Oh, thank and, you. And, uh, well, I'm really to mind. do it. So and thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. And um, I'm sure we're going to get a zillion texts and such, but uh, yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Awesome. Hey. Thank yeah. you guys so much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Check us out. Remember, Words Open every day at both stores from 11 to 5. So you can come on down and visit us safely from a distance in person, too. And Rachel, thank you so much. All right. Thank Bye. you, guys. Have Appreciate a good night. You. Thank you. Bye.